Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. According to the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. So in this crazy presidential campaign, the question I have is, should a journalist covering a candidate just report what the candidate says, or should they call out the misstatements like the candidate that the candidate makes? Bob Kaiser is a former managing editor and senior correspondent of the Washington Post and the author and co-author of eight books, most recently about Congress, money, and how Washington works. And he's my guest today. Oh, Hi. Greetings. My introduction wasn't generous enough. I mean, you were, you were born in D.C. I was. You worked at the Washington Post for over 50 years? 51 years. You were a reporter, a foreign correspondent, in what? London, Moscow, Saigon, Saigon, and then you became an editor, yep. and then the managing editor. So you really knew Washington across a whole long time. Uh, you wrote an opinion piece when you moved here, and it was called "The Republicans Have Lost Their Mind, The Democrats Have Lost Their Soul, and Washington Has Lost Its Appeal." What was that? <laughs> well, I guess that was a rationalization for leaving my hometown to move to New York, which I, I must say I do not regret for a moment. It's been great in New York. But it's a, it's a sad commentary. I, my generation was, your generation was the Kennedy generation. We, we came of age with JFK and we were inspired and lots of people, including you, got into politics to save the world. Right. It was very idealistic. And I went into journalism with the same kind of yeah. idealistic spirit. And I, I fear that we can describe the last half a century as a period of slow and steady erosion of that idealism, replaced by a kind of profound cynicism, beautifully think, embodied by Mr. Trump's candidacy. And you think it, it yeah. started under Reagan? I mean, you said that Newt Gingrich was the worst politician you ever well, the, 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 until now <laughs> not the worst of this is in the f sense of effectiveness he was no, very, painfully effective yeah but he was he did the most damage certainly how uh, and that and that started before Reagan just before Reagan well, Newt Gingrich in my mind and I wrote about it in, mm -hmm. in uh, so damn much money is the guy who invented full-time partisan warfare the permanent campaign. One of the most profound changes in Washington in my time was the decision collectively reached by many members of the House and Senate that they should not live in Washington. They should maintain their residence at home where they came from and commute to Washington. Newt Gingrich at one point told his members, his Republican House members, you must not live in Washington. When I was a kid in the late 40s, early 50s, I went to a day camp. One of my best friends was Hubert Humphrey's son, Skip. We played baseball together at the, at the Bethesda, Maryland day camp that we went to <laughs> because the Humphreys lived in Washington. They didn't live in Minnesota. I don't know how often Humphrey went back to Minnesota, but he considered the job of a senator was located in Washington, D.C. And I grew up with that assumption myself. But that's not true now. The House and the Senate work three days a week, usually, maybe a three and a half in Washington, and then they take off. Uh, interestingly, 50 years ago, they had a very modest allocation of money to pay for tickets to fly home. Uh, now they have an effectively unlimited budget travel. for travel, because so they could go every weekend. And, you know, it's not a partisan thing. Nancy Pelosi is just as crazy. She flies home to San Francisco every Thursday night and comes back to D.C. on Sunday or Monday. It's just nutty. But this guarantees that there are no personal relationships. People don't know each other. In the old Washington, you'd root for each other's kids in the high school football team or basketball team because... They all went to the same schools, the children of congressmen. Now they don't they go to school back home. They're not even there. So the, the, this is that plus the Gingrich 
permanent campaign and warfare all the time, yeah. always looking for partisan advantage, uh, which sadly the Democrats embraced too over time. So it's just this constant battle, and it's all about scoring points. Uh, you know, there's this concept, which I first heard about in the in the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton administration, and called winning the day. Who won the day? Meaning, whose coverage on the evening news looked the best? You know, who was the most friendly? What a ridiculous idea! It's not the day we care about. It's the yeah. you know, course of the country and its affairs. So this, there's just been a terrible erosion of sensible culture in my view political it's very interesting so yeah. they they don't know each other now yeah. and and before they did but knowing each other didn't necessarily compromise their opinions or principles no of course not but and it allowed them to work together better absolutely and it was you know the idea that you should work together was through the 70s pretty universal in members of the house and senate mm -hmm. it was a good thing to cooperate mm -hmm. if you could find a basis honestly to do so and that's no longer the case it's now you know the worst the biggest change in my time the biggest change by far is in the redefinition of the republican party i grew up in a republican with a republican party whose key members enabled lyndon johnson to pass the civil rights bills for example mm -hmm. one of the great senators of my time early time was Jake Chavitz of New York, mm -hmm. who was more liberal then than half the Democrats or more in the Senate. Clifford Case in New Jersey, right. Lowell Weicker from Connecticut. Right. We were surrounded by him up here. Moderate, sensible Republicans, mm -hmm. sensible by my lights, <laughs> the, but, but very moderate people. Yeah. But they believed in government. You know, yeah. the, what a, a key moment in the history of my Washington was Lyndon, was uh, Ronald Reagan's inaugural address, where he pronounced Trouble. the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. A ridiculous statement, in my opinion, but one that set the tone for really from that time to today, where we still have an anti-government majority. Mm -hmm. It's stronger than ever mm -hmm. in the Republican caucus and the House Representatives. It is. It's a whole distrust, isn't it? Yeah. And Reagan did the the the, um, the de you know the uh, whatever you call it. <laughs> deregulation. Yes. Although, to his, to be fair, Carter started that. Yeah, we did. With the, with the air, airplane deregulation. Airplane right. Deregulation. But yeah. but also, then when when did the role of money? When did that become so important? It's a gradual process. Uh, it's, uh, and that too is part of the erosion of the standards of our politics, in my view. In the late 70s, it began to become obvious that you could win elections by following the advice of pollsters and campaign consultants who would tell you what to say, how to say it, would make the TV commercials that showed you saying it, or or made the same points in some other way. When did, let me interrupt. When did the pollsters and the paid staffs and all of that really start? In the 70s, late second in the half 70? of the 70s. 78 election was the first great victory for this school. Uh, and it's just gotten worse since. But the, the fact is that the, the, the facts were that if you use these technologies of politics, particularly polling and commercial making, ad making, you could prevail. And soon, the old value of having a strong view, knowing what you believed and why you believed it, no longer mattered. People would enter politics on the grounds that they were good at raising money and that they were presentable physically, had a nice voice, and they would sell themselves like soap. And, uh, we've all seen that. But it was a very conscious change. So it also, <clears throat> television helped that too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, the, and, and then the cost of television increased the money that you needed. Exactly. Right. So that the, I have the numbers in, so I don't have much mm -hmm. money. I don't keep them in my head. But the average cost of a winning Senate campaign yes. went from a couple hundred thousand dollars 
in the 70s to millions, to millions and millions today. Yeah. Millions. Yeah. And it's, well, how, do you do, how do you cope with that? Well, you spend, if you're a senator who wants to get reelected, you spend routinely two days a week on the telephone calling strangers begging for money. Both parties have these offices on Capitol Hill equipped with telephones and computer screens. And these poor sons of bitches have to go up there and sit and watch these screens. Names come up, telephone numbers. They sit there. They, they can't it, even do it from their office. They call it dialing for oh, dollars. Of course they can't do it it's from their the office. Law yeah. from the office. Isn't it amazing? So they, do they actually sit next to each other doing it? Yeah. I, I wonder, I've, that, you know, they have little booths, so they have a certain amount of privacy. But it's weird. The, they, they also have now fundraising consultants. Oh, yeah. Fundraising consultants' jobs are to create lists of potential donors. So if you're a liberal Democrat, your, your fundraising consultant has a list of all the rich people in New York City, for example, who give to liberal Democrats, some of whom you may have met, some of whom you may never have met. But you call them up. Uh, the screen tells you what the wife's name is, how many kids they've got where they go to kids go to college, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you can pretend to be, like you know who they are and, and what their lives are. And it is so phony. And it's just so deeply ingrained now. It's terrible. And, and the, the, the public is obviously very cynical about their politicians, understandably. But I don't think a lot of people have understand how radically this changed over a really relatively brief period of time, over 20 or 30 years. It's, you know, I mean, I remember it. We have to be our age, I guess, to yeah. remember what it was like. So it's always kind if, of shocking. If we still remember here. things. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, <clears throat> when the uh, Southern Democrats became Republicans, that also, you said, made a big difference. Huge difference. Party. And that was Nixon's gift yeah. to posterity. But, but, I mean, you know, it made a certain amount of sense. Nixon really. actually went after them. Nixon had the famous Southern strategy, uh, which was based on the logic that these people no longer agree mm -hmm. with the dominant faction mm -hmm. of the Democratic Party, uh, which was true from 1948 onward, really, when Strom Thurmond, then a Democrat, created the Dixiecrat Party. That when did it become fashionable not to call yourself a liberal? When did this progressive this, this come? This is a very good question. This was one of Newt's triumphs, in my opinion. There's this extraordinary figure called Frank Luntz, oh, right. who you may have heard of from still Connecticut. Around. Still around. Uh, Luntz was, I think, the original author of the idea that it really matters what language you use. So he and Newt were friendly, and, and he worked for Newt. They created a long list of instructions, they're in the so damn much money, of what you can say and what you shouldn't say. So you should always use strong masculine language. You should always portray your opponent as weak and all this stuff. And it was he who decided that liberal should become a swear word. That to be a liberal was to be a weakling, pathetic, you know, in the hands of special interests, special pleaders, etc. And I mean one of the one of the phenomena that used to drove me crazy because as I watched it happen was starting with Newt in the late 70s and the early 80s and Reagan. Don't bank to me. Sorry. Democrats lost intellectual self-confidence. They just got scared. Uh, one of the key moments in the evolution or more accurately the devolution of the modern Democratic Party I write in the So Damn Much Money was the appointment of Tony Coelho of California as the chairman of the House Democratic Campaign Committee, which is the main fundraising arm for Democrats. This was in the early 80s. Coelho is a good guy and a very effective guy, took the position that we control the House of Representatives and then the Senate as well, and we should use our position of power in Congress to curry favor with corporate donors, rich people, because mm -hmm. <laughs> they've got the money and we need the money or we'll lose our majorities. And the election, the big landslide election of Reagan in 1980, 
really undermined Democratic confidence. People said, how did that happen? We had this movie actor comes along with a crazy right-wing platform and he clobbers us. Maybe the country is changing. We've got to get shape up here. That was the opening that Coelho took advantage of. And he persuaded Tip O'Neill, then the leader of the Democrats, and all the others, that they should do this. And they created, you know, golf with the speaker, for example. Oh. Play golf with Tip O'Neill. It'll just cost you $5,000, whatever it was. Um, and you can use 18 holes of golf to make your case for whatever you're looking for to the Speaker of the House, and so on. Um, so soon this was a game being played by both parties. Uh, and I, this is where I think, as you quoted my headline, the, the Democrats lost their soul. They forgot who they, whose side they were on. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, very deleterious. And the, the whole deregulation thing, which came to its apogee with the deregulation of the financial sector under Bill Clinton, which I think had a lot to do with the great crash of 2008. Mm -hmm. That was part of this, very much part of this. Do you, um, I mean, I remember the Democratic Party when it had a platform that was really important and it covered what the agenda was. But it was more important than little individual agendas. But now, with all the different advocates for specific groups, yes, yes. That's hurt too, hasn't it? I think in that piece, I can't remember the language I used, but yeah. I wrote something about how the Democratic Party had become a conglomeration of interests, interest groups. Uh, but it also it, ties it, into the money. Oh, yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the women is a good example. Uh, one of the most powerful lobbies in, in politics now is Emily's List. Yeah. This group run by women to promote women politicians and their campaigns. Awfully hard for people like you and me to say that's a bad thing, yeah. but it has a bad effect because it, it contributes to the balkanization of the party right. so that you, you're, you're known by which groups you're lined up with. Uh, instead of being lined up with the Democratic Party, you can be lined up with the Hispanic Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Women, the Gay and Lesbian Caucus, and so yeah. on. It's a, but the money, it uh, goes along with what the culture of the country is, or which set which, you know, yes, that money is so important. Yes, and that, I think, we're beginning to get the first historians writing about this in an interesting way. I think that was the Reagan era, this sudden decision, and it transformed everything. It transformed American corporations, which became focused entirely on shareholder value, right? Maximum return to shareholders. So, and that's it became the era of takeovers, hostile takeovers, where companies that didn't maximize mm -hmm. shareholder value were They're suddenly vulnerable to outsiders coming in with aggressive takeover campaigns. In, in the book on lobbying, so, yeah. so damn much money, uh, you illustrate how money then draws people from the staff or former yes. elected officials. They go out the door and they become lobbyists, and the money is what, 50 times more than they were making Can be, yeah. in public service. This, so the role of the lobbyist is so right. accelerated. This revolving door uh, and this willingness of public figures on both sides to sell their fame and expertise, which they acquired entirely from public life, from serving in government, uh, is one of the saddest changes. Mm -hmm. And it's everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. the Clinton family's astounding earnings is giving speeches for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, is, is a sadly it's reflected in all government. It's reflected it certainly in the city and state Absolutely. governments. You Absolutely. go out and you become a lobbyist. or You take all the experience. It's almost like you went to school when you worked for the government, yes. right? And then you become the consultant or the well, lawyer that's going to do it. And in the last 20 years in Washington, you saw this. Yeah. Young people... Yeah. went up to Capitol Hill with the idea, very explicit idea, they would work for two years or five years or even 10 years just to prepare themselves to leave. But you even have members of Congress now. Yeah. There are scores of members of the House and Senate who are now registered lobbyists. So let's now talk about the bottom line and journalism. What's happened with papers? 
Well, <laughs> those are not the same questions, of course. No. There's a lot of interesting journalism being done today. In different ways. By organizations yeah. that aren't papers. Right. Let's uh, talk about the newspapers. But so. the newspapers themselves, that's another of my books. I, my <laughs> wonderful colleague, Len Downey, the former editor of the Post, we wrote a book together called The News About the News. We published this book in the, around 2002, I think it was. We had no idea what was Listen. coming. Yeah. The subtitle of our book was American Journalism in Peril. We, were, we had no inkling of how much peril uh, it's turned out to be. Uh, it, this, this too is an economic transformation. The main fact we now can say and acknowledge of the economic success of the old newspapers that we grew up with was not that they were fabulously successful, effective advertising media. It was that they were the only effective advertising media. They were relatively effective. They weren't absolutely effective. So in New York City, for example, when we were young, <laughs> B. Oldman, Mm -hmm. Gimbel and Macy mm -hmm. and all the other department stores all used the newspapers to reach mass audiences in hopes of getting them into the store. This was, it's interesting, well, well, in this class. was Bond would tell of this building we're in right no, now. Albans. Albans. Albans, yeah. Albans. And then you had example. classified ads. Yes, but the, that's exactly the other thing, key thing, help wanted, car for sale, apartment for rent, yeah. those little small print, yeah classified ads were a money wagon for the newspapers, hugely profitable. Both those things were wildly inefficient. If you had an apartment to rent and you were a landlord, how many people did you need to read the ad? Mm. Well, one mm. who wanted an apartment around West 72nd Street on the Upper West Side, and you have what they're looking for, that's all you needed was one. But you had to pay literally to reach thing. millions. Yeah. That was the problem with newspaper advertising. So the internet comes along and two things happen. Google figures out that we can sell advertising for a consumer product only to people that have done a search on their computer in the last month for that product. So we can say, don't waste your money on a newspaper ad going to all kinds of people who don't care about what you're selling. Only aim it at people that know, you know want to buy it. Similarly, Craig's List, the most yeah, devastating the development, for free. He didn't even make any money on it. He just gave away <laughs> the whole thing. I have to interrupt this because we only have three minutes. Oh. So we've got to get together, get back to the introduction. Yes. Does a newspaper person or a journalist, is a journalist supposed to report what they say or is it supposed to tell the truth? Uh, both. And that can be difficult. You, you mentioned the conflict. conventions, journalistic conventions yes. that pre present, yeah, which prevents it. What I'm is very that? happy to say that thanks to Mr. Trump, those conventions have eroded in a good way. The, the convention was the, on the one hand, on the other hand. You've got to be even-handed. Oh, you've got to, if you quote Clinton denouncing Trump, you've got to go to Trump and say, uh. well, you want to respond to Clinton which they still do, that's a mistake yeah. in my view. But interestingly, we've seen Trump gets up and says something ridiculous, such as, I always was against the war in Iraq. And now on CNN, I'm pleased to say, when he says something like that, you can see that thing streaming across the bottom of the screen saying, actually, he never came out against the war in Iraq, and so on. So he, they're fact checking. They're, they're they fact checking go. as they go, which is a very healthy development, particularly because you quoted that wonderful Moynihan mm -hmm. quote. Moynihan here says, you're not entitled to your own facts. Mm -hmm. But a lot of politicians now says, who says I'm not? Hell no, I can say whatever I want. Like uh, there's no global warming. Like there's, it's a fraud, <laughs> right, exactly. So it's a real problem. But it's, uh, it, it, for, for journalists need more courage and the, and the consumers need to demand more honesty. But I think it's changing in a good way. So Trump is really, the natural extension. You're not surprised by a Trump candidacy. No, I'm really not, sadly. Yeah. Because it's just, it's, a, it's the just desserts, in my view, of the Republicans flirting with this anti-government nonsense, right. as though we can live without a government. Uh, 
and then they, they encourage this Tea Party thinking. We you mentioned it specifically when they wouldn't raise the, the debt ceiling. Well, they flirted with putting us into bankruptcy. Incredible. So now they've gotten there what they wanted. Yeah, maybe. And, and what are we going to get? Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, pre are, are, you're increasingly satisfied with the way we're it's no. being reported? No, no, I'm not, because we didn't have time to go into the yeah. economic strains on the news business. Yeah. But there aren't enough well-off news organizations that can support really strong investigative reporting. We have to do this again because you wrote the obit for Ben Bradley, yeah. who was the editor yes. of the uh, Washington Post. For many years. And that just, that drew the picture of how glorious yes. the age of yeah, the newspapers. Age was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Well, thanks, Bob Kaiser. Thank you. I fun. hope people read these books because they're really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.